I want to express again uh, my, my gratitude uh, for, for the chance to, to hold this meeting in this beautiful place. Um, all right, uh, in, in, my, in my previous lecture, I promised that there would be evidence for a connection between real algebraic geometry and, um, uh, and, and uh, Whitney problems. Now, uh, I, I have evidence, but I do not pretend to understand the connection. I believe and, and cannot prove, but I believe that the connection is much deeper than, than anything that you will hear in this, in this lecture. But I at least have strong evidence that there is some connection. All right, so on this blackboard, I'm going to discuss the classic Whitney problem, and on this blackboard, I'm going to discuss a particular problem of real algebraic geometry. All right. So the classic Whitney problem, going back to Whitney in 1934, is the following. So in, in throughout, we're going to work in CM of Rn, all right? CM functions of Rn. So in the classic Whitney problem, Whitney 1934, we're given a real valued function defined on a set E in Rn. Let's make it compact, but otherwise completely arbitrary. Okay? Um, question, how can we decide whether f, this function extends, that is, whether there exists a function f in Cm of Rn such that f equals little f on e. That's the classic Whitney problem. All right, here I'm going to mention a problem of real algebraic geometry. I'm afraid I will not have time to motivate it properly. I, I will just say that the motivation for this, uh, this lecture consists of, of a list of, of algebraic geometers who were interested in it. So the, the relevant people are Brenner, Epstein, Hoxter, Kolar, from whom I learned about the problem, and Novak. And the problem is the following. So suppose I have a system of linear equations for unknown functions. These guys are polynomials on Rn, and so are these. Okay? But these are not polynomials, these are unknown CM functions. And the question is, well, so there, there are two questions. How can we decide whether a given system of this form has a CM solution. That's one question. And the second question is for fixed, for fixed A's, the set of all F's for which the equations have a CM solution forms a module 
over the polynomial ring, the ring of polynomials in, um, on Rn. Of course, if, right, if, you have any, if you have any Fs for which there is a CM solution and you multiply the Fs by a polynomial, the, low, the lowercase Fs, you could, mul uh, you could multiply the, the capital Fs by the same polynomial. So it forms a module. And the problem is exhibit generators. Maybe I give a little bit of motivation. This is maybe too, too dry to be completely unmotivated. Um, for example, suppose, suppose that I give you, um, in Rn, I give you the zero set of some polynomials. Let's say this, this zero set is smooth. And I look and I fix a particular denominator, Q. And I look at all rational functions of the form P over Q for the, for the denominator Q. And I ask, when are such rational functions uh, CM functions on the given uh, smooth algebraic variety? That question is a little special case of the question I've just written for the case of one by one matrices. Okay, so this contains uh, reasonable questions about, uh, uh, about real algebraic geometry. Okay, so the statements of the questions are, are clear. Now, I'd like to convince you that, in fact, these two questions uh, can be answered, uh, well, I'm sorry, all right. This question and this question are very, very closely related, and I will explain that, and if I have time, I, I will explain uh, this. Let, let me just say uh, that, that the work on, on real algebraic geometry is, is joint work with Kevin. Okay. All right. Now, in order, in order to understand, um, in order to understand both of these uh, questions, uh, a, an important thing to do is to forget about a lot of detail. And so I'd like to explain how one, one views both of these questions in the right abstract setting. Uh, the right abstract setting seems to an analyst like abstract nonsense. Uh, I will show you a little bit of very elementary algebra. Uh, I myself last passed an exam on algebra about 50 years ago. Um, so I, um, <clears throat> this will be very elementary. but. So it will appear to be uh, abstract nonsense, but it, I claim it is the right setting in which to study that question and that question. And, and then we will forget about where the abstract setting came from and just study the abstract question, solve it completely, and, and declare victory. Um, okay, so what is the abstract setting? Well, let me, let me converge to it by talking about this problem and talking about that problem. All right, so uh, let, let, let me first, maybe here, here's neutral ground, I'll, I'll set up notation. Okay, so as yesterday, J X of F, the jet at X of F, this is simply the nth degree Taylor polynomial of F about, about X. Okay? And this polynomial belongs to script P. This is the vector space of all uh, polynomials, real valued polynomials on Rn of degree at most M. Okay. Um, it's going to be important, all right, there's algebra floating around. It's going to be important to multiply polynomials. And so uh, Kevin discussed uh, yesterday this circle product. This, uh, if, if I have two jets, P and Q, and a point X, this product is defined to be the jet at X of P times Q. This is for P and Q in script P. And the point, of, the point of this product is that if I take the jet at X of a product of two smooth functions, that is equal to the circle product of the two jets. 
And so this product is usually called jet multiplication. Okay? Now, jet multiplication makes P into a ring. So the ring I'm going to call Rx, and that's the ring P uh, with the multiplication dot x. So this is a ring. I'm going to keep track of the value of x. Of course, as the point x varies, these rings are all trivially isomorphic to one another, but they are not identical, so I want to distinguish them. Okay? All right. Um, I will be working with vector-valued functions because over there uh, uh, we have vectors floating around. And so um, if I have a vector p with, let's say, d components, uh, I'm going to write that this is in p to the d. So each, each component pi is a polynomial. And there is a multiplication of these guys by polynomials. If Q, if Q is a polynomial, then Q circle product P equals Q circle product P1, Q circle product PD. Okay? And that again is in PD. And this multiplication makes PD into a, into a module over Rx, okay? So PD is a, mod, is a module over the ring Rx. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and finally, also, if we have if we have vector-valued functions f, I can either think of this as consisting of d scalar-valued functions, or I can think of it as a single function in Rn with values in Rd. And of course, its jet is then defined simply to be the jet of f1 through the jet of fd the vector of jets, which is then in PD. Okay, so that, that sets up the notation. All right, now having set up the notation, let's come back to this problem, and I would like to, um, I would like to reformulate it um, in, a, in an obviously equivalent way, but using this kind of language. Okay, so for each, for each x in E, let's introduce the following objects. First of all, H of x is the set of all polynomials, uh, all jets P, uh, such that P of x is equal to F of x. Of course, if there is a function capital F that agrees with little f on E, uh, its jet at x will belong here. A particular element of this guy is the jet f sub x to be distinguished from the function value f of x. This is a jet, and this is simply the constant polynomial whose value everywhere is f of x. And of course, that's a particularly simple element of H of x, okay? And finally, I want to introduce I of x, and that's the set of all polynomials P and script P, such that P of x equals zero, okay? Now, what is the relationship among all these guys, and what do they have to do with this problem? Let me just spell out the obvious answers. First of all, this fellow, is an ideal in the ring Rx, okay? This fellow, uh, this fellow is a translate of that ideal. H of x is equal to Fx plus I of x, so it's a coset of an ideal. 
between Rx. And what I'm interested in is, uh, so I want to find functions in Cm of Rn such that the jet of x, the jet at x of f is in h of x for all x, uh, for all, yes, for all x in E. Okay, that's, so obviously, I mean, well, so everything I've said here is obvious. The, uh, what we want is this because capital F satisfies this condition if and only if it agrees with little f at E. Okay, let's, let's, make, a comparable, uh, let's make a comparable discussion of this case. Now, let's see, all right, the set of blackboards is magnificent but finite, so maybe I should use that blackboard to, to discuss the analogous setup for, uh, um, for the Brenner, Epstein, Hoxter, Kolar, Novak problem. Uh, let's see. Okay, so let's, let's look at, um, all right, let's define here h of x to be the set of all p1 to p, now let's see, uh, how many capital f's are there? There are uh, j max of them in p to the d, such that, let's say, for example, the sum on j of a i j of x, these are just function values, they're not they're not jets, and then uh, p j of x equals f i of x for i equals one to i max. Okay, um, that's analogous to that h. Let's let let me take uh, let's say capital F sub X to be uh, any particular vector of constant polynomials C1 to C J max such that um, the sum j of a i j of x c j equals f i of x for i equals one to i max. Let me stop for a moment and say any particular vector, uh, wait a minute, is there such a vector? Maybe not. Why should there be? This is a, a system of linear equations in, in however many unknowns. Maybe it has a solution, maybe it doesn't. If it doesn't have a solution, it's highly unlikely that that system of equations for CM functions has a solution. And so for each particular x, we just ask whether the numerical uh, uh, system of, of linear equations has a solution or not. And if not, we, we declare that we understand perfectly whether that has a solution, namely obviously not. All right. So if we survive that test, then there is a solution and we pick one. We pick, for example, the shortest vector that solves this problem. Why not? Pick, I mean, fix, fix your favorite uh, Hilbert space structure on, on Rj max and, and pick the shortest vector. Okay. Uh, and that's analogous to this little f sub x. And the analog of the ideal i now is i of x, which is the set of all p1 through p j max in p to the d, such that the sum on j of a i j of x, uh, p j of x equals zero for j equals one to, whoops, for i, sorry, for i equals one to i max. Okay. Now, um, by analogy with this, well, ju just look. First of all, um, this, this is, um, this guy belongs 
to h of x. This guy is an Rx submodule of p to the d, because if we take if we take any polynomials that do that and we multiply all of the polynomials by the same factor q, of course the products still do that and the multiplication here will be jet multiplication. Okay? So this is a submodule and furthermore, um, this guy is a coset of the submodule, so h of x is equal to capital Fx plus i of x. So this is a, co this is a coset of the submodule. I of x. And what we want are functions f in cm of rn with values in r to the power j max such that the jet at x of f belongs to h of x for all x in E. And that means precisely that, that the equations are satisfied, okay? So um, those are the, then the, the, uh, the particular incarnations of the problem. They look, you know, look at, look at this list of stuff and look at this list of stuff and they look very, very similar. The only difference is that here we're, we have vector valued things and modules and here we have scalar valued things and ideals. So now, now perhaps I will erase everything except uh, maybe except this second question uh, and, and I will ask in the, in the abstract, okay, I'll ask the abstract form of the question and then answer it. Now, uh, Let's see, notice this, these questions appear to be uh, questions of algebraic geometry. We have here the word, the word polynomials, which suggests that, that um, this, this is not just a question of pure analysis. Uh, it, it turns out that the answer to question one is, um, is, is obtained by forgetting that these are polynomials and simply solving the more general problem. Uh, in question two, we are not so lucky, and there is inevitably actual algebra uh, in there somewhere, because here we, uh, um, well, so first of all, there is, there is analysis because we have the word CM. We cannot solve any problem with the word CM in it without some analysis. On the other hand, what we are asked for is to find generators for a module of, over a, of, of vectors of polynomials over a polynomial ring. That's the kind of thing we're asked to solve, and so this is a problem about polynomials, whereas this was a problem that appeared to be about polynomials, but is in fact more general. Since this is a problem actually dealing with polynomials, some algebra is required. And so this, this one cannot be solved purely by analysis, and it cannot be solved purely by algebra. Okay. Um, well, oh, all right, so we put that aside and I will erase a lot of other stuff and now just discuss the abstract problem and how to solve it. So let's say, let's say um, that E in Rn is compact. All right, I'm going to define a bundle with apologies to geometers. A bundle is a, fam is a family. I'll write it script H 
And it's a family of objects h of x, notice those h of x, x and e, where each h of x is a coset of an ideal in, oh, not a, I'm sorry, I want the vector valued version, so a, of a submodule of an Rx submodule of uh, p to the d. So here we are fixing, we are fixing m, n, and d, and we work with functions f that are in, in cm, and they map rn to rd. Okay. So this is, um, this is uh, a bundle. I, I want to make a very strange looking change in the definition of a bundle. It's either this or the empty set, and I'll explain why in a little while. But I want to allow as a special exception for any particular x uh, that the fiber over x, this h of x might be uh, empty. I'm going to call this guy the fiber of the bundle h at the point x, all right? I'm going to say that a subbundle, let's say we have h prime, so suppose we have two bundles. h prime is h prime of x, x in E, and h is h of x, x in E. These are two bundles over the same set E, and I want to say that uh, H is a subbundle I'll write it that way if and only if simply H prime of X contains H of X maybe they're equal for each X in E so that's what I mean by a subbundle and I'd like to say oh let's see where shall we go? Whoop. Come back. Um, and I'd like to say that F in CM of Rn with values in Rd is a section of the bundle H. If simply its jet at, at X belongs to H of X for all X in E. Okay? So notice in, in the classic Whitney problem, which I erased, and in the, in, in the, the question one of, of the algebraic geometers, in both cases, the question is, here is a bundle, I show it to you. Does it have a section? Okay. Um, so the general question that includes both of them is simply given a bundle decide whether H has a section. And if we can do that, we can solve both the algebraic geometry problem and the, uh, and the classic Whitney problem. Okay. Now, um, all right. Um, <laughs> Oh, a, a little preliminary remark. Um, I, I owe you later an explanation for this very strange uh, um, change in the definition in which the fiber uh, at a point may be the empty set. Notice that if the fiber at any point is the empty set, uh, this condition is highly unlikely, and so the bundle does not have a section. Okay. 
All right, now the reason for that is that the, there, this, the general solution of this question uh, is obtained by something called the Glaser refinement. So maybe, maybe I comment on the name Glazer for a moment and just say a little bit about the history of the problem. Uh, uh, real progress on the classic Whitney problem uh, was, was very slow in coming. Every, every couple of decades there was a new idea. Um, let's see, Whitney certainly made a tremendous contribution. The, um, uh, the, next, the next significant contribution was due to uh, Georges Glazer who in 1958, first of all, improved somewhat uh, 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 Whitney's, uh, Whitney's 1934 result, which, so that I don't want to talk about. That, that, was a good, that was a good piece of work, but that's not the big, big idea that, that uh, puts his name here. Uh, Glazer uh, solved the classic Whitney problem in the case of C1 of Rn. And he did it using a very remarkable geometrical construction, which, which he called the paratangent space. And he made this construction repeatedly, and he therefore formed out of, um, uh, out of the C1 incarnation of the Whitney problem, he formed the iterated paratangent space. Um, decades later, uh, Beerstone, Millman, and Pawlowski um, found a version of the iterated paratangent space for CM of Rn in, in a semi, uh, in a semi-analytic, semi-algebraic, I don't know, semi-analytic setting, I think. Um, and, uh, all, all right, so, so they adopted, uh, they ad adapted his idea to that, and, and I adapted it still further, and then Kevin and I adapted it still further, but, but the idea goes back to Glazer, and the, the basic idea is this, so given, Given a bundle H, we can construct the Glazer refinement. Uh, let, let me call it G for Glazer, GH. And this is a sub-bundle. The definition is going to be somewhat technical, so instead of telling you what it is right away, I'm going to tell you what it does, and then I'll come back and tell you what it is. Okay? So this is a sub-bundle of, of H. With, with two key properties. The first, well, so the three key properties. Here, here this, is, this is the zeroth key property. It's a sub-bundle. Second key property, even though it's a sub-bundle, so the, sec the, uh, the fibers are smaller, nevertheless, every section of H is a section of the Glazer refinement of H. So somehow passing from H to its Glazer refinement throws away irrelevant stuff where sections cannot, uh, cannot penetrate, okay? And just keeps where, where the sections might be. Um, so in particular, H and GH have the same section and also uh, GH is computable from H. Now, in, in yesterday's lecture, I discussed with a little bit of care um, what it means to compute a function, and, and uh, I, I was using a computer. Here, we're unashamedly in the setting of infinite sets, and so what do I mean computable? Uh, what, uh, what I mean in practice is that when I show you the definition, I think you will agree that it is computable. That's what I mean, okay? So, um, all right, these are the basic properties of the Glazer refinement. Now, once, uh, uh, however, however, an, an incidental property of the Glazer refinement is that it, it may be that you started out with a bundle H with no empty fibers. It may happen that the Glazer refinement will have some empty fibers. That's why I changed the definition there to allow for an empty fiber in, in the definition of a bundle. Some of the fibers of GH may be empty, okay? So um, once we have a Glazer, once we have the idea of a Glazer refinement um, following Glazer, we can, we can then iterate the construction. Now, when, when should I stop? 
at 10. Okay, yes? Sections should be continuous. I'm sorry? Sections. Sections are CM. In fact, they're CM. The M is predetermined. So yes, sections are CM. The bundles themselves can look very weird. The, the, the dimension of the fiber may not be a measurable function of the, uh, of the base point. Uh, there are no restrictions at all on, on, how the on how the fiber varies with the base point. But sections are CM functions. OK. A and any other questions? In the initial problem, uh, yes. We don't assume that the CN functions are rational functions. Oh, um, all right. In the original problem, or right, actually, if you look at what the algebraic geometers wanted, they were interested in the case m equals zero. So they simply asked, uh, given a set of polynomial equations, the, no rational functions, just uh, uh, given a set of polynomial equations uh, with the polynomial right hand side, but with the unknowns being continuous functions. How can you decide whether that has a solution? Okay. And so, in fact, uh, uh, Kolar and I wrote, wrote a joint paper with two solutions of that problem, one making use of the polynomials and, and doing some algebraic geometry that I wish I understood, although I'm a joint author, um, and, and the other, uh, the stuff that I'm explaining here uh, in the C0 case. Um, again, the, the CM case is due to, to uh, Kevin and me. All right, anyway, so we have, we have Glazer refinements, which I haven't yet defined, but I've made promises about them. And so now we're going to iterate the Glazer refinement. And so we, to start with, we have a bundle H. We rename it H0. We're interested in finding sections of H0. Aha. It contains H1. H1 is the Glazer refinement of H0. So we've found a smaller bundle, and our problem is to determine whether this has any sections, and these two have the same sections. So we have made progress, and we are happy. This is a bundle, and so we can take its Glazer refinement, which we call H2, and that's perhaps still smaller. And uh, we have made, therefore, further progress, and we are even happier. And we keep going. OK? Now, there is the danger that we keep going forever, becoming happier and happier and happier, but never actually accomplishing anything. <laughs> OK? However, <laughs> however uh, there, is, there is a very simple, clever lemma that goes back to Glazer that was adapted from Glazer uh, by Beerstone Millman Pavlusky, and that was adapted from their lemma by me, and that was adapted uh, from that uh, by, by Kevin and me. But the idea is very, very simple and goes back to Glazer, and it is uh, a stabilization lemma. And the stabilization lemma says that for a large enough constant L star, which is determined by m, n, and d. Remember, we're dealing with functions in cm of, from rn to rd. All right. Uh, it happens that all of these are the same. It, the thing stabilizes. So L star plus HL star plus 1 is HL star. Well, so HL star is HL star plus 1. And so from then on, they're all the same. And so at this point, uh, you, have, you have milked uh, the Glazer refinement for everything it can give you, and you should stop Glazer refining. And at this point, we have arrived at a bundle which is Glazer stable. So in particular, H L star is its own Glazer refinement. So let's call that something, Glazer stable. So by doing elementary computation, we can pass from our original bundle to a sub-bundle which is Glazer stable and which contains the core of the problem. Okay? And so we can modify our original question to, um, uh, to the heart of the matter.
So the heart of the matter is, um, let H be a glazer stable bundle. How can we tell whether H has H has a section? Okay? And the answer is very, very simple. At least it is very, very simple to state. It's not very, very simple to prove, and I will say nothing about the proof. Okay. Um, but the answer is there exists a section if and only if all fibers are non-empty. So obviously, if there are any empty fibers, there are no sections. But that's the only reason for there being no sections. Okay? And so that is the complete answer to all of the questions except the, this one in which um, analysis and, and algebra are, are mixed. Well, that's the complete answer, except that I haven't told you what the Glazer refinement is, so let me take, I don't know, five or ten minutes and tell you what the Glazer refinement is. Okay. <laughs> Let's come over here. Okay. Um, and any any questions? Okay. This this reminds me of the one and only time I gave. Oh no, it's one of two times I gave a lecture in French. Um, those of you who have spoken French with me know just how superb my French is, and so I practiced very carefully. Um, I gave I gave a math lecture to the. Uh, to the animals in the in the zoo, and um, and then then it came time for me to give my uh, my lecture in French, and everything went very well for about half an hour until until someone asked a question. Uh, I did not understand the question, but someone gave the someone knew the answer and provided it, which I also didn't understand. But apparently, but apparently the answer wasn't quite right because someone objected, and it got out of control, and pretty soon there was a lively discussion. Uh, involving everyone in the room except me. It lasted about 10 minutes, and the question was finally settled to everyone's satisfaction, uh, and, and I continued. And there's more to the story, but I don't have time. Anyway, okay. All right, all right, so what is the Glazer refinement? Okay, so we have a bundle H. Here it is. Okay, uh, the Glazer refinement is going to be defined. Well, it's a bundle also, so it had better be a collection of fibers like that, and I have to tell you what the H tildes are. Okay, so given X0 in E and given P0 in H of X, we say that P0 is in H tilde of X0, whoops, this is X0, if and only if the following holds. All right. All right. So, all right, given epsilon, there exists delta such that for any Oh, uh, whoops, I should have said, um, we're going to fix once and for all some large, const some large integer constant k depending on m, n, and d. Okay, now we're defining the Glazer refinement, this constant k comes in for any points x1 through xk in E that lie very close to x0, namely in the ball of radius delta about x0, okay, there exist 
polynomials P1 in H of X1 through PK in H of XK such that, well, before I finish the sentence, notice we had a P0 to begin with, and the sentence continues, there exist P1 through PK. So at this point, there are P0 through PK, and now such that what? Well, such that the following estimates hold. D alpha of PI minus PJ of XI less than or equal to epsilon times Xi minus Xj to the power M minus alpha for alpha less than or equal to M and I and J equal 0, 1 through, um, through K. Notice, notice P0 is included here in, in the subject of the, yeah, as a subject of the discussion, the P0 is that one. Again, the P1 through PK exist there. Um, there is a small embarrassment in this expression. What if Xi happens to equal Xj, and what if absolute alpha equals M? Then we've got zero to the zero. By convention, zero to the zero equals zero. Okay. So um, that's, uh, that's the definition of the Glazer refinement. Let's, let's take just a moment to prove Let's just take a moment to prove uh, the things that I said about the Glazer refinement. So first of all, the Glazer refinement is a subbundle of H. Now, I guess I would have to prove that it is a bundle, that is, that, that the H tilde is either the empty set or a coset of an ideal. Let me not do that. I have not enough time, and you have not enough interest. I promise you it is trivial. Um, OK. The, uh, um, all right. Let's, let's check that every section of H is a section of GH, and that's trivial from the definitions and Taylor's theorem, okay? Suppose, suppose that capital F, maybe I should write something. Um, okay, um, suppose that, um, capital F is a section of H. I have to prove that it's also a section of H tilde, the Glazer refinement. Um, or I'm sorry, of GH, the Glazer refinement. So that means that given X0 in E, uh, I must show that P0 which is the jet at x0 of f belongs to h tilde, whoops, uh, h tilde of x0. That's what it means to be a section of h tilde. How do I show that? Well, given epsilon, there has to exist a delta such that blah, blah, blah. How will I pick p1 through pk? And the answer is we're going to pick uh, p1 to be the jet at x1 of f through PK, and PK is the jet at XK of F. Okay? We have to check these conditions. Um, let's see. The P's obviously belong to the corresponding H's because capital F is assumed to be a section of our original bundle. So these conditions are automatic. How about these conditions? Well, given epsilon, there exists a delta such that if the X's are in here, this is guaranteed, it's just Taylor's theorem, okay, for the function capital F. And so that proves that every section uh, of this is a section of that. And finally, this thing is computable. Uh, I'll take, I don't know, 30 seconds um, and do that. Let us take, let's move this into the denominator, this over that. Let's sum the squares of all those uh, over all pairs ij and over all alphas. That's a quadratic form. We are minimizing the quadratic, uh, we're minimizing the quadratic form over this affine subspace. That's linear algebra. Once we have found that minimum, uh, we then assert that that minimum tends to zero as the x's tend to x zero while remaining in the set E. 
And so we do some linear algebra to calculate a number depending on x1 through xk, and we, we claim that its limit is zero. And so if we can do linear algebra and calculate limits, we can decide whether this is true or not. And in that sense, the, the Glaser refinement is, is computable. Okay, that's the, all right. Now I have 10 minutes left, and for the 10 minutes, I would like to explain um, this problem. Okay. Um, <laughs> and maybe end with an unsolved problem. All right. <laughs> Come back here. Stay. All right. Um, so again, uh, this problem combines algebra and analysis. What are we going to do about that? We're going to split this problem in two. The first part of the problem involves 99% analysis and 1% algebra. And the second part of the problem involves 100% algebra. Um, we will then solve each, each of the problems separately. So how, how do we split it? Well, in order to obtain an analysis problem, we are, um, <laughs> oh, I'm afraid this is not very well formulated. Maybe I can put the equations back. Uh, let, let me just work with one equation. The idea is actually the same for a system. All right, so suppose that A1 of x, F1 of x, we want to solve this equation, plus A D of x, F D of x, equals f of x. The a's and the f were supposed to be polynomials, but the capital F's are unknown CM functions. Okay. Now, uh, in order to obtain an analysis problem out of this, that, that's, that's part of the, we peel off part of the difficulty, uh, let's Let's remember that these guys are polynomials, but let's forget that this is a polynomial, but let's declare that it's a C infinity function. Okay, and let's ask for a C infinity function, when, when does this admit a solution? So, um, given F in C infinity, this equation admits a CM solution, well, if and only if what? So the problem is to characterize that. And the solution is the following. This admits a CM solution, F1 to FD, if and only if F is annihilated by finitely many linear partial differential operators with semi-algebraic coefficients. Okay. Furthermore, the proof is constructive. One can exhibit the, the semi-algebraic, uh, the, the linear differential operators with semi-algebraic coefficients. I haven't the faintest hope of conveying the proof of this, which is pretty formidable, but I would like to show you one simple example and point out one feature of the differential operators. So uh, I'm going to show you one example which is, was already discussed by uh, Hoxter. Uh, it was a counterexample to some conjecture that I don't have time to discuss. Um, let's look at the equation. Uh, so we're in, we're in R3. And a point of R3 is x, y, z. Okay? Then look at the equation x squared f1 plus y squared f2 plus x, y, z squared f3 equals little f. Okay? Where these functions, these capital F's, are assumed to be merely continuous. And so we could ask, for which C infinity functions, little f, 
can this be solved? This is a nice exercise. It's not entirely trivial, but it's not entirely difficult. It's somewhere in between. And I, I will tell you the answer. And so if f is in C infinity, this has a solution with, with, C, with continuous capital Fs, if and only if the following things happen. So first of all, f vanishes on the, on the z-axis. The x and y derivatives vanish on the z-axis. Okay, and the, uh, the following mixed partials vanish at the origin. Okay. Um, notice something strange. The unknowns are supposed to be merely in C0, but the highest order differential operator we need to think about is of third order. So the, op the order of the operators can, and can be and often is strictly greater than the degree of smoothness of the, of the desired solutions, capital F. So our differential operators in this case are, for example, uh, the indicator function of the origin uh, times the third partial x, y, z, and let's say the indicator function of uh, the z-axis um, times the partial with respect to x, and so on, a short list of such things. These indicator functions are semi-algebraic functions, and, uh, and, and so this is, this is a little, simple, special case of that, okay? Uh, uh, th the proof of this starts, it has as its starting point all that stuff about Glaser refinements and so on that I was talking about before and then builds on it. So uh, not, not a chance to explain. But finally, suppose, uh, uh, suppose that you believe the proof of, of this, uh, suppose you believe this theorem and so you are handed a, a list of differential operators and then finally the, the question is, uh, okay, now how do we how do we exhibit generators for the, for the polynomial ring of solutions F? By now, because I'm looking at only one equation, it's a, it's a ring instead of a module. Uh, so I have an ideal and I want to find generators for the ideal. Um, all right, H how do you do that? Well, so we know that um, thanks to this theorem, we are interested in all polynomials that satisfy a family of linear partial differential equations. Find generators for that ideal. Wait a minute, ideal? What are we talking about? If I give you a list of polynomials, uh, I'm sorry, if I give you a list of differential operators and I ask you um, to find all polynomials annihilated by those differential operators, that's typically not an ideal. It happens that, that, the, uh, that it is an ideal for the particular differential operators that come out of this theorem because, it, I mean, the, the the F, the little f's for which there exists a solution obviously form an ideal. But, um, but in general, if I simply give you a list of differential operators, the solutions don't form an ideal. Oh, damn, that, that I mean, what are we going to do about that? One could, one could panic and, and then investigate the structure of these differential operators, or one could uh, stay calm and do the following, okay? Uh, and I'm relatively calm given that I have, what, one minute left, two minutes left? Okay. Um, so, okay. So, suppose, suppose I have differential operators L nu, nu varies from one to something or other, and I'm looking at all the solutions of that, and I'm worried because they don't form an ideal. So, these are all polynomials F. Damn, those don't form an ideal. All right, let me form an ideal. So I won't, I won't study this problem. I will look at all polynomials f such that L nu of q times f is zero for all nu and all polynomials q. 
that obviously is an ideal. In the particular case in which this happened to be an ideal, this is the same ideal. Now I have a nice clean separation for any list of, of linear differential operators with semi-algebraic coefficients. I ask, I, I look at this, it is an ideal in a polynomial ring, find generators. That's a problem of pure computational algebra. As far as I know, it hasn't been considered before, but we slogged through it and it can be done. Okay, uh, so, so that's that. Let, let, let me end with, with one question. Um, if, if, we have, uh, if we have these, um, uh, if the coefficients there, capital A1 through AD, are polynomials, and if the little f is a polynomial, you could then wonder, all right, suppose that there is uh, a CM solution. What kind of CM solution is it? Is it, for example, a rational function? And Kolar and, and Novak have an example to prove that, that it can happen, that there is, I think, a continuous solution in the case m equals zero. Uh, there can be a C0 solution, which, however, is not, I mean, but there is not a C0 rational function, a solution in which, the, in, in which the fellows are rational functions. In the example, they can be taken to be semi-algebraic functions. It's natural to guess that whenever there is a CM solution, there is a CM semi-algebraic solution, and as for, I, mean, I don't know how to do that. Uh, and I actually look forward to asking uh, some of the experts in the audience about such things. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? And uh, we were asked to use this microphone uh, to ask questions because they have to be recorded. So if you have questions, please uh, come up and I will give you the microphone. No questions? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I would be frightened myself. <laughs> uh, I have a question then. Okay. Uh, there was a very nice, what, uh, somewhere in the 70s, uh, yes. a series of papers by Kolomudov who described the, um, the, the oh, uh, yes. polynomial um, the modules of C infinity functions. Oh, yes. Uh, and some of the answers. Yes. Uh, rem uh, just remind me of that. Right? Okay. Uh, I, in fact, yes, so thank you. I, I, should, I should have mentioned this. Uh, so Palomorov studied this, uh, Aaron Price studied this, Macrange studied, mm -hmm. studied this. Um, th there, there is a lot known about the C infinity case. W what is happening here is that there is a, a CM for a particular M, which means that, that compared to that, one is not allowed to lose any derivatives. You have to understand precisely how smooth the solution is. Um, the, the C infinity uh, questions were, I think, were, were motivated a lot by, uh, uh, by PDE and by several complex variables. And uh, these, um, let's see, so one might wonder uh, why did the algebraic geometers get into this or, or why did Whitney ask what he did? And I think Whitney's question is just a fundamental question about life. And, uh, um, the, the algebraic geometers, I, so I'm not sure. I can, I, can see, I can see a justification, but I actually don't know why, why they got into, um, into the subject. Um, on the other hand, I, I do not believe that this, is the, that this is anything like the full story about the connection uh, between Whitney's problem and real algebraic geometry. Rather, I believe, I believe and cannot at all prove, just, this is a hunch, that there is a lot more to the connection than meets the eye, and, and I present this as the first evidence that there is something. The thing is that uh, your result when you uh, produce the partial differential equations with yes. uh, semi-algebraic oh, equations, oh, 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 oh. Uh, reminds me because in the oh, oh, they, in uh, papers, it yes. used also a set of, uh, but not a set of linear PDEs, but with very small coefficients. Right, okay. right, right. Yeah, right. right, 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 right. Um, okay, well, um, or what should I say? Yes, that's the correct thing to say. Yes, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. That was the question. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Any other questions? Don't be afraid. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Nevertheless, no okay. other questions. Okay. So let us thank the speaker again. Okay.